Hello! In this video, we are going to recreate Lewis structures for the same compounds for which we created structures in episode 103, part 1. What will be different about this particular video is that we are using a new style of card. These cards are the same size and shape and have most of the same characteristics as the cards that we have used on the other videos. The big difference, which you might notice right here for fluorine, is that rather than merely uh, color coding the name of the element, we've actually used that color to fill in the octagon of the card to make a much brighter and more visually appealing card. The colors that we use are the ones that are standard in most molecular modeling programs such as RASMAL and JMAL. So uh, the color that's used for fluorine is a sort of orange. We realize that fluorine has seven valence electrons. Fluorine exists as a diatomic gas, F2. Therefore, in the entire molecule, there are going to be 14 valence electrons. And we want to allocate those 14 valence electrons in such a way that we can satisfy the octet rule for each of the fluorine atoms. And we're reminded that fluorine has to satisfy the octet rule because there are eight holes around each fluorine atom and the little boxes are shaded in a light gray telling us that these are required. So we can allocate our 14 electrons in the following manner. We are using a color code, even for the electrons, which isn't absolutely necessary, but it reminds us that if we think of the red electrons as being up electrons and the blue electrons as being down, that each of these electron pairs corresponds to the two electrons that can be placed in one orbital according to the Pauli exclusion principle. And we notice that once we've allocated our 14 electrons, so long as that we have a single bond, a fluorine-fluorine single bond, we are able to satisfy the octet rule for each of the two fluorine atoms. Fluorine, as an element, is incredibly reactive for several reasons that we can understand even from a simple Lewis structure. Fluorine-fluorine has a single bond. Single bonds tend to be rather long and weak, particularly for the second row elements. So particularly for nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine, the single bonds tend to be extra weak. Also, we recall that fluorine is the most electronegative of all the elements and has the second largest electron affinity. So once fluorine would break along the spine, each of the atoms would get one electron. It would become very easily reduced. It wants to pick up one more electron to become F minus. Elemental oxygen exists primarily as a diatomic gas, O2, to generate the Lewis structure for this particular molecule. We recall that oxygen has six valence electrons. So for two oxygen atoms, we have a total of 12 valence electrons that we need to allocate across the molecule in such a way that we can satisfy the octet rule for each of the oxygen atoms. To assist us in this, uh, we have devised special cards for oxygen such that each of these oxygen atoms can form one single, a double bond. So by forming a double bond between the two oxygen atoms, this oxygen at the left has two, four, six, eight electrons. These all count for the left oxygen. For the right oxygen, we count two, four, six, eight. So each of the oxygen atoms has eight electrons. An important thing to realize here is that when we have a double bond, double bonds are shorter and stronger than single bonds. And the relevance of this will become more important when we look at the next couple species that also involve two oxygen atoms.
During the biological process of respiration, electrons are ultimately transferred to oxygen. The role of oxygen in respiration is ultimately to accept electrons. If O2 accepts just one electron, it forms a special ion, O2, with a minus one charge, which we give the name superoxide to. So since each oxygen has six valence electrons, for the two oxygens together we have 12, then we need to add one electron to account for the minus one charge, so that superoxide is a 13 electron system. And it actually turns out that it is an unlucky number because superoxide is an incredibly reactive intermediate. And we can understand why it is so reactive by just looking at the Lewis structure. One of the things that we recognize is that it has an odd number of electrons. There are only 13. 13 is an odd number. Therefore, there's no way to satisfy the octet rule, eight being an even number. Whenever we have an odd number of electrons, we recall that we have species which are called free radicals, and free radicals tend to be very, very reactive. In addition to that, we see that after we've added one electron to O2, having reduced it, we've also lowered the bond order from a double bond to a single bond. And we recall that single bonds tend to be longer and weaker than double bonds. And we also might recall that single bonds for the second row elements, such as nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine, tend to be particularly weak. So all those things considered, we can readily understand just from the Lewis structure why superoxide would be such a reactive intermediate. If, during a biological process, an O2 molecule were to accept two electrons, we would form another ion, which we call peroxide. It has the chemical formula O2 with a minus two charge. Each of the oxygens contributes six valence electrons. So that gives us a total of 12 just for the oxygens. And since the molecule has a minus two charge, we need a total of 14 electrons. So we want to allocate our 14 electrons in such a way that we can satisfy, if possible, the octet rule for each of the oxygen atoms. And we can do that, we add a 14th electron here, and we see that we have satisfied the octet rule for the left oxygen and for the right oxygen, and that we no longer have a free radical. Even at that, peroxide is relatively reactive because even though it is not a free radical, we still feature this oxygen-oxygen single bond, which we recall tends to be very weak. And one of the things that this particular bond can do, it can break in such a way that this electron pair, one electron goes with one oxygen, one goes with the other, and in the process, we end up forming two free radicals. The element nitrogen exists as a diatomic gas. Each nitrogen atom contributes five valence electrons. Therefore, for two nitrogen atoms, we have a total of 10 valence electrons. Therefore, we want to allocate our 10 valence electrons in such a way that we satisfy the octet rule for each of the nitrogen atoms. The way that we can do that is to form a nitrogen-nitrogen triple bond. And here we see specialized cards uh, for nitrogen so that the nitrogen atoms can each form a triple bond. And they're also in the more brightly colored blue. Uh, this is a more highly colored style of card that we've developed. So if we do this, we see that for the left nitrogen, we have two, four, six, eight. So that has the octet rule satisfied. And for the rightmost nitrogen, we have two, four, six, eight. Those all count for the right nitrogen. Therefore, we've satisfied the octet rule for each of the nitrogen atoms. As we might suspect, if a double bond is stronger than a single bond, then a triple bond should be even stronger than a double bond. And it is true. The nitrogen-nitrogen triple bond is an incredibly strong bond. We've noticed that a double bond is shorter than a single bond. We might predict 
that a triple bond would be even shorter than a double bond. Again, that is true. So this nitrogen-nitrogen bond is very strong, very short, therefore making elemental nitrogen in the form of N2 incredibly unreactive. In fact, it is so unreactive that it was dubbed azote by Lavoisier. Azote meaning not alive. In fact, in the Russian language, the word that is used for the element nitrogen is actually azote, A-Z-O-T. Now, it turns out that even though nitrogen is incredibly unreactive, there are two ways to make it reactive uh, that are commonly encountered. One way is at high heat. So if we burn fossil fuels, for example, in the presence of oxygen and ordinary air where there's 80% nitrogen at high temperature, we can break the nitrogen-nitrogen bond and get nitrogen to react particularly with oxygen to form nitric oxide. Lightning will also break the nitrogen-nitrogen bond, and that was probably an important source of ultimately the amino acids on Earth. The nitrogen from the atmosphere was made reactive by lightning passing through it. There is even a third way, sort of in nature, by which N2 becomes more reactive and gets incorporated into other molecules. There are specialized bacteria of the genus Rhizobium, which actually can uh, turn nitrogen into other compounds, and it can do it at one atmosphere of pressure and at room temperature, which is quite an amazing feat. One ion that is of tremendous importance in both inorganic and organic chemistry has the chemical formula C2 with a minus 2 charge. In organic chemistry, we call this the acetylide ion, and in inorganic chemistry, we call it the carbide ion. Each carbon contributes four valence electrons, so that gives us a total of eight electrons just from the carbon atoms. Since it has a minus two charge, we need to add two more electrons. So therefore, this particular ion is a 10 electron system. And having just watched the video, you might notice that we had just seen another 10 electron system, nitrogen, N2. Therefore, the Lewis structure of acetylide ion, of carbide ion, is exactly the same formally as the structure for N2. We have a carbon-carbon triple bond and two lone pairs at the end, just as we had a nitrogen-nitrogen triple bond and two lone pairs at the end for N2. In these particular cases, we say that the two compounds or ions are isoelectronic. So we say that acetylene ion, carbon ion, is isoelectronic to N2, just as N2 was incredibly stable and unreactive, we would predict correctly that carbide, acetylene ion, is also incredibly unreactive and incredibly stable. We have to be careful, though, of not pushing this isoelectronic analogy too far because we would recall that nitrogen, for example, is a neutral molecule, whereas acetylide carbide has a minus two charge. So that accounts for some difference in the re reactivity, but we should always keep in mind these cases where we can use essentially the same Lewis structure for two or even more compounds, because that will make our task of generating valid Lewis structures much more easy and much more systematic.